right. Thank you. Uh, please come up to the podium with your client. Sir, please raise your right hand. You swear or affirm the testimony you're about to provide will be the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth and a penalty of perjury? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Put your hand down. Sir, you pled in docket 17-526 FC count one criminal sexual conduct first degree person under 13 defendant 17 or older that is punishable by up to life. Do you recall that? Yes, Your Honor. Counts two. Criminal sexual conduct, first degree, person under 13, defendant 17 or older, punishable by up to life. Do you recall that as well? Yes, Your Honor. Count five. Criminal sexual conduct, first degree, relationship, punishable by up to life. Do you recall that? Yes, Your Honor. Count eight. Criminal sexual conduct, first degree, relationship, person 13 to 15, punishable by up to life. Do you recall that as well? Yes, Your Honor. Count 10, criminal sexual conduct, first degree, relationship, person 13 to 15, punishable by up to life. Do you recall that? Yes, Your Honor. Count 18, criminal sexual conduct, first degree, relationship, person 13 to 15, punishable by up to life. Do you recall that? <coughs> yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Count 24, <coughs> criminal sexual conduct, first degree, person under 13, punishable by up to life. Do you recall that? Yes, Your Honor. And you understand that you are here for sentencing today? Yes, Your Honor. And you've had enough time to discuss any sentencing issues you have with your attorneys, is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Have both counsel and defendant had an opportunity to read the pre-sentence investigation report on behalf of the people? We have, Your Honor. Yes. On behalf of defendant? We have, Your Honor. Sir, have you gone over the pre-sentence investigation report with your attorneys? Yes, Your Honor. All right, thank you. On behalf of the people, any corrections, additions, deletions? <coughs> On behalf of the defendant. Your Honor, we have no additions, corrections, or deletions. Thank you. And as to the scoring of the guidelines, any corrections? On behalf of the people? Judge, I believe that we have stipulated that the accurate scoring of the guidelines I do have that, but as to any of the PRVs or OVs, those are correct? Yes, Your Honor. All right, you all agree? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Your Honor, there's only a, one other thing in the report that we agreed needed to be fixed. It's not with respect to the substance of the report. There's a line in there about consecutive sentencing, and pursuant to Michigan law, there is actually not consecutive sentencing available in this case. And Ms. Povolaitis and I have talked about it. I believe we stipulate that that's correct. I have concurrent sentence listed as yes on the sentencing guideline sheet. Is it incorrect somewhere in the report? Yes, they wrote in the report somewhere else that it was possible to do consecutive sentencing. Um, I don't believe they've recommended it, but I think it's important we just have the report look correct. And what page is that on counsel? I am trying to find what I'm sorry. It's usually in the evaluation of the plan. Right there, okay, it's on, um, oh, I'm sorry. It's correct now. It just says the people shall not object to concurrent sentencing. I think there was another spot. I apologize, Your Honor. I thought that it was still in there. No, it's always better to be safe. I do have under evaluation and plan in paragraph three, negatively speaking, defendant was recently sentenced to, in federal court, to 20 years prison consecutively. Uh, the word appears there. It doesn't appear that there's any other. Uh, in regards to the federal case, this docket shall run consecutive as outlined in the federal court sentencing. That's all correct, Your Honor. Right. It was the, um, it, it must have been a previous report that I okay. had reviewed and talked to Ms. Povolaitis about. All right, looks like everything is in order as I scan. All okay. right, thank May you. I, um,
the defendants for the OB11 and 13, which is not allowed. Um, I would ask that OB11 be deleted. That would be um, 25 points reduced. OB13 is accurate at 50. I have OB13. Which count are you looking at? Because I'm conviction three of seven. I have OB11 at 25 and OB13 at 25. I don't know why they redid this. You just said it was, should be 50? Yes, Judge, for all of those. Your Honor, I, we apologize. We got this this morning, and we had reviewed it a couple days ago, and I obviously there are some amendments. We agree with the prosecution. OB11 should be zero. OB13 should be 50. And I believe the scoring that was reflected on the record is correct, although this uh, sheet is not. Wait, wait, let me just stop you right there. I don't want people talking over. I have, first of all, in my sentencing information sheet, I believe they are kept out of order. My first one says three of seven, then it goes to four of seven, and then it goes to three of seven again. Either it's duplicate or something's out of order, and the three should be a one. Does that make sense I, I, to you? I think it's too funny because you know, the, the guidelines do not apply for um, the first two counts, so they can turn them 25, so those you can take out. They also don't apply to the older case. The guidelines apply to these four counts. So three of seven, four of seven, five of seven, and okay. then correct is seven. Yeah. seven. And that's what I'm asking. Yes. There were two three of seven. So the three of seven is now five of seven. And should they all be zero and 50? They, they should, yeah. And some of them are listed as zero and 50 and some are not, but they all should be. Okay, let me just take a moment and correct that. This one's wrong. Mm -hmm. All right, the record should reflect that three of seven has been corrected. It doesn't change the total OB, but to be correct. So four of seven is correct. Five of seven is now I have struck eleven where it said twenty-five will be eleven and put a zero and fifty was correct. And then six of seven I'm striking on over eleven to twenty-five it now reflects zero. And Total will be on that bench should be 75, is that correct? Nope. Yeah, 75. And also on 5 of 7, the total should be 75. So I'm striking 100 on both of those. It appears they are all now correct. I do need to make those changes on the basic information sheet. I'll just take a moment. Information sheet. I'm changing the OV total from 175 on the last two counts. And then, Your Honor, on the last two counts, I believe the guideline minimum range range also needs to be changed to reflect 108 to 180. Yes, 108 to 180. Struck the 135 to 225 and change it to 108 to 180 on the last two. I'll also change the basic information sheet to look like that as well. Any other corrections, additions, solutions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. At this time, are there victims who wish to speak? There are. Right. All right. Mr. Nasser, I am going to ask that you and one of your attorneys be seated in the witness stand for the convenience of the witnesses so they don't have to keep turning around.
Sir, if you could just move closer to me. I'm going to have the seat next to you for counsel, please. So that everyone knows, the people are going to be calling the victims, and if there's any need for a victim to not have their face shown or their voice, that will be an indication to me and the media that the cameras are down and or off or refocused. So depending on the situation, if there's any minor who wishes to speak, that I need their parent or guardian to tell me that's all right. And we have a number of rules that we're going to abide by to respect everyone in this court and the victim's rights. So at this time, who is the, do you have any other comment you wish to say? Nope. I think I've covered it? Yes, thank you. All right, thank you. So at this time, we will have our first victim. Yes. Judge, the first victim will be publicly identified, and her name is Ms. Kyle Stevens. She has asked for two support persons. I will be standing in support of her, as will her mother. Okay. Thank you. I've been known as victim ZA, or family friend. I was the first to testify in this case, and wary of the attention that could come with that, I asked for complete anonymity. This process has been horrific, but surprisingly therapeutic. I'm addressing you publicly today as a final step and statement to myself that I have nothing to be ashamed of. I met Larry Nassar when I was somewhere around the age of five years old. My parents had become close friends with Larry and his wife, Stephanie. They were all medical professionals and shared a passion for the subject. Most Sundays, Stephanie and my mother would cook dinner together for both families. We shared sporting events, holidays, and many weekends in between. It was during this time, I estimate I was approximately six years old, that Larry Nassar began to sexually abuse me. He first exposed his penis to me in a dark boiler room in the basement of his home. He told me, if you ever want to see it, all you have to do is ask. He used his power as an adult to manipulate me. Over a six year period, he progressed from exposure to masturbating in front of me while playing hide and go seek, rubbing his bare penis on my bare feet and penetrating my vagina with his fingers. All of which took place with my parents, my sibling, his wife and his children in the same house. Let me remind you of the interests of a six-year-old girl. My favorite TV show was Clifford the Big Red Dog, and my favorite book was Junie B. Jones. I could not do a multiplication problem and still had not lost all my baby teeth. I think we can all agree that someone of this maturity level should not be sexually active. But I was. Without, without my knowledge or consent, I had engaged in my first sexual experience by kindergarten and it joined an overwhelming statistic of sexual abuse victims. It took the media coverage of the sexual abuse scandal in the Catholic Church and a friend confining the details of her sexual abuse for me to realize that something was wrong. 
I was 12 years old when I told my parents, when Larry rubbed my feet, he uses his penis. My parents confronted him and he denied any such action. Due to complex details that I won't get into here, my parents chose to believe Larry Nassar over me. I spent the years between 12 and 18 avoiding and detaching from my family. To my father, someone who makes such heinous false accusations is the worst type of person. His belief that I had lied seeped into the foundation of our relationship. Every time we got into a fight, he would tell me you need to apologize to Larry. I learned to ask for very little, as I wanted my parents to know that I didn't need them, just as I felt they didn't want me. It wasn't until I was about to leave for college, when my father again pulled the you need to apologize card, that I took another chance at clearing my name. I told him that I wasn't lying, and that Larry Nassar had indeed sexually abused me. Larry Nassar's actions had already caused me significant anguish, but I hurt worse as I watched my father realize what he had put me through. My father and I did our best to patch up our tattered relationship before he committed suicide in 2016. Admittedly, my father was experiencing debilitating health issues, but had he not had to bear the shame and self-loathing that stemmed from his defense of Larry Nassar, I believe he would have had a fighting chance for his life. Larry Nassar wedged himself between myself and my family and used his leverage as my parents' trusted friend to pry us apart until we fractured. And fractured we did. My relationship with my mother is still marbled with pain, anger, and resentment. And for a long time, I told people that I did not have a family. I think it is important to note my relationship with the Nassar family after I accused him at age 12. A year or two passed from the time that I made the accusation and our families began to spend time together again. I was around 14 years old when Stephanie began pressuring me to babysit the Nassar's three children. I responded with dismissive answers for a lengthy period of time before relenting. It was at this point that I began to feel brainwashed. At home, I was a liar, and when I was at the Nassar's, either with my family or babysitting, it was as if I had never accused him. I felt I was losing my grip on reality. I started to question whether the abuse ever really happened. For my own sanity, I forced myself to walk through the abuse step by step, so I didn't forget that I was not a liar. It is to this that I credit my ability to recall the abuse so well throughout this process. As I continued to babysit for the Nassars, I started to become resolved to my purpose there. With two young girls in the home, I felt protective and that somehow my presence there would make a difference. For seven years and several years into counseling, for seven years and several years into counseling, I cared for those children with all my heart. My detachment from my family forced me to search for grants, participate in post-traumatic studies, ask for sliding scales, and babysit for the Nassars to pay for my own counseling. When I look back now, I realize that my spirit was broken, lost, and confused. But then all I could think is that I needed to be there for those children in whatever way I could. It was not until I was 21 that I cut all ties with the Nassar family. The complex feelings of shame, disgust, and self-hatred brought me bouts of depression, anxiety, eating disorders, and other compulsive conditions. Sometimes I think it's hard for people to translate these generic terms into reality. For me, it was a girl crying on the floor for hours, trying not to rip out too much of her hair. For me, it was a girl wanting the pain to stop so badly that she woke up for months to the thought, I wanna die. For me, it was a girl getting out her gun and laying it on the bed just to remind herself that she has control over her own life. For me, it was a girl that spent so much time trying to fix herself 
that she forgot what she actually enjoys doing. Sexual abuse is so much more than a disturbing physical act. It changes the trajectory of a victim's life, and that is something that no one has the right to do. Your Honor, with your permission, I would now like to address the defendant. You may. After my parents confronted you, they brought you back to my house to speak with me. Sitting on my living room couch, I listened to you tell me, no one should ever do that, and if they do, you should tell someone. Well, Larry, I'm here, not to tell someone, but to tell everyone. You convinced my parents that I was a liar that you didn't strategically place lotion in the basement so you could beat your penis in my face while I hid. But I still get sick at the smell of that lotion. You convinced my parents that you didn't pull my feet into your lap, unzip your pants, and rub your erect penis against my bare skin. But I still flinch when my feet are near someone's lap. You convinced my parents that you didn't stick your fingers in my adolescent vagina. But I knew when it was time to use my first tampon, not to worry, because my hymen wasn't intact. You used my body for six years for your own sexual gratification. That is unforgivable. I've been coming for you for a long time. I told counselors your name in hopes that they would report you. I have reported you to Child Protective Services twice. I gave a testament to get your medical license revoked. You were first arrested on my charges. And now, as the only non-medical victim to come forward, I testify to let the world know that you are a repulsive liar and that those treatments were pathetically veiled sexual abuse. Perhaps you have figured it out by now, but little girls don't stay little forever. They grow into strong women that return to destroy your world. Your Honor, there is no time that Larry Nassau can serve that will give me back those years with my family, or the time and energy I spent sorting out my anger, frustration, and confusion. But I can tell you this, our law does not do enough to prevent predatory acts and often does not do enough to punish predators who have committed the hideous act of abusing a child. I can also tell you, Larry Nassar is a predator without boundaries. His patients weren't safe, his friends' children weren't safe, and even his own children weren't safe. If he is ever allowed to re-enter society, he will not hesitate to re-offend. We have all done our part to get to this point and will continue to do our part to combat the diseased societal thinking that kept 100 plus victims quiet for decades. But right here, right now, it's your turn. I implore you to do your part. Make a statement that forces other predators to think twice. Keep Larry Nassar out of our communities. I ask for a minimum of 40 and a maximum of 125. Thank you. Thank you. The system clearly failed you, and it has failed so many children, people without voices, but you certainly have grown into a beautiful, smart, intelligent woman who has a voice. This voice that you have just let out publicly will have that rippling effect to change legislation, to change the lives of children who are being abused to speak up like you. What's so important is that you weren't sure what was going on, but you kept questioning. And when you heard other voices, you knew it was wrong. And it's so important what you've just said to all those children and helpless people. And it is a shame you're not alone, that your family didn't listen, that they trust the abuser. But you as a small child had nothing to gain, nothing, by complaining. And still your voice went unheard. I promise you, it's not unheard now. Thank you. I have one question for you. Mm -hmm. Are you seeking restitution from Larry Nasser? No. 
we can leave it open. Do you understand what restitution is? Um, restitution makes you whole. And I know that you need counseling. You've paid for your own counseling. So it's something that I can order to make you financially whole. I understand you may never fully feel whole, but I think you're on your way to healing. But for those needs that you might have, I certainly can order restitution. I don't know anything about the civil case. I've kept myself away from other things that would affect us. I don't know if you're part of that or not. I don't know if that case will live or die. I don't know what the judgment may or may not be. There's no guarantees with that. Restitution, there is a guarantee that if for some reason he has money, earns money, inherits money, whatever, goes to the victims first. So if that's something you would like, I can leave it open so you can think about it. I'm not interested in any money that would take anything from his children, so no thank you. Okay. Thank you. Judge, um, so the record is clear. What I'm going to be displaying on the screen throughout the victim impact statements for those that have given permission and photographs are photographs of the um, survivors at the time of the abuse. So um, for the record, I have Kyle's um, pictures. Our next victim is a minor. She has indicated that she wishes to, to, to be public. She is currently 17 years old, and her parents are in the courtroom. If you'd like me to question them to confirm that before I announce her name, um, I don't believe, I think she's going to be coming up bravely on her own. All right, so she can come on up. Does she have a parent here? She do, but the parent her also mother, approach? Yes. What is your name? I'm Jessica Tomasho. Could you state and spell it for the record? J-E-S-S-I-C-A-T-H-O-M-A-S-H-O-W. All right. And you are 17? Yes. And you wish to speak? Yes. All right. As to mom and dad, mom, what is your name? Could you state and spell it? Yes. Suzanne Tomasho. S-U-Z-A-N-N-E-T-H-O-M-A-S-H-O-W. Dan? Uh, Michael Thomashow, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-T-H. All right, could you both raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm the testimony or about you provide would be the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth under penalty of perjury? I do. You need to speak. I do. I do. Thank you. Um, you may put your hands down. So you are the parents of uh, the beautiful woman in front of me, correct? Yes. I need you, you to speak up, ma'am. Yes, I am. Thank you. Yes, I am. And do you give her permission to speak? Yes, I do. And you had an opportunity to speak with her about her face and voice being public and her words? Yes, we have. Yes. All right. And there's been no forced threat or coercion um, or promises made to her in regard to speaking, correct? Correct. All right. Thank you. You may stay thank here you. with her or you may have a seat. So the media is clear. She has publicly identified her photos on the screen, and I'll let her take off. Hi, right. Jessica. Are you going to speak or read? Read. You're going to read. Okay. Yes. Just read at a pace that we can understand, not too fast. Okay. No yes. In the building. Okay. Yes. All right. Okay. Thank you, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Honorable Judge Aquilina, thank you for giving me this opportunity to tell you how Larry Nassar has hurt me and the effect that this has had on my life. I am Jessica Tomasho, also known as Victim A. I was sexually assaulted by Larry Nassar when I was 9 and 12 years old. Today, I am 17 and a senior in high school, and this is my story. My childhood was filled with happiness and love. One of my loves was for gymnastics and for all my teammates in the gym. Gymnastics was a big part of my childhood, and I spent many hours in the gym and at competitions. Though, as you know, with gymnastics, it is a very physically demanding sport and often comes with painful injuries. I remember one of my first injuries, a rib misplacement. This was the first time I heard of Larry Nassar and his reputation. I remember telling my mom that my coaches told me I should see Larry Nassar for my injury. 
And to my surprise, she knew who he was. She had trained under him when she went to medical school at Michigan State University. One night, my coaches arranged for me to see Nassar after practice to help with my rib injury. Monday nights were when Larry Nassar came to Twist Arves to treat injured team gymnast. I remember my coaches telling me to go see him, and I was actually quite excited. Then I went into the back room, and that's when everything changed. I was alone in the back room with him. He had me lie down on the table, and he sexually assaulted me. He touched the most innocent places on my body that day. I remember fear and pain and asking myself, what is happening? When it was over, I was so confused. What had he just done to me and why? It was awful and embarrassing. I left and kept the disgusting thing that had just happened to me back to myself. Two years passed. I saw him several times again at his clinic at MSU, always with my mom, and they were normal appointments. Then in 2012, it happened again, right around my 12th birthday. I had a stress fracture in my ankle and my dad took me to that appointment. Before Nassar assaulted me, we had a great meaningful conversation about my future. He asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up. And I said, I want to be just like you, a sports medicine doctor. He gave me a gift, a pin from the Olympics and told me, when you take my place as the new sports medicine doctor for gymnastics, then you can give me back this pin. Nassar then told my dad he, he had to massage my ankle and it would be okay for him to wait in the waiting room. After he left, Nassar told the medical student to leave the room too. After the room was clear, he did it yet again. He slid, he slid his ungloved hand up my leg and back into the most innocent part of my body and I felt searing pain. For 30 minutes, he inserted his fingers into me and grunted while I lay there terrified. Again, I was confused by what had just happened. He was a trusted doctor and what he did to me didn't make sense in my child's mind. I didn't tell a soul and I try not to think about it anymore, but my dream of becoming a sports medicine doctor ended that day, along with my happy and trusting self. He had broken me. I lived the next several years in limbo. Being sexually assaulted has changed me into an anxious teen, but I did not know that I had been abused and that was the source of my anxiety. I no longer felt safe and I had, trouble, and I had problems with trust. My, my parents took me to a psychiatrist and a therapist when I was in ninth grade and this helped. I was, di I was diagnosed with and treated for social anxiety disorder and saw a therapist on a weekly basis, but did not have insight into the cause. In the seventh and eighth grade, I felt extremely uncomfortable around my male teachers. I avoided them, I hated talking to them, and I would feel panic if I was ever alone with them in a room. Back then, I didn't understand why I felt this way because all my peers loved our teachers. But being assaulted affected my relationship with my teachers. And my anxiety was so intense that it made it hard to focus and learn at school. I also developed an intense fear of male hands, like a PTSD response. Now I get flashbacks when I see male hands and it makes me feel scared and threatened. This fear changed the way I grew up and how I related to boys. I did not want to hold hands or ever be close to my guy friends. I couldn't be just a normal girl anymore, and I have forever lost a big piece of my childhood due to his abuse. When the first Indie Star article came out, my life changed. I put the pieces together and realized I was molested by Larry Nassar. I thought back to my appointments with him and could still feel what my nine and 12 year old self felt then, alone, scared, and in pain. I wanted to puke. I could feel his hands touching me, and that was the first time I had my first flashback. And to this day, I still have them. The flashbacks are paralyzing. I had one just two weeks ago at school and could barely get out of my seat. Thankfully, I was able to stop my brain and went to the office. I cried for an hour, shaking with fear. I would like, I would like to say something to my abuser, Larry Nassar. You took advantage of my innocence and trust. You were my doctor and I trusted you and you took complete advantage of that. Why? I used to ask myself that question all the time, especially while I was laying in bed crying myself to sleep. What you did to me was so twisted. You manipulated me and my entire family. How dare you? You had no right to do that. And because of your decision to molest me, you have caused so much pain in my life. 
and for the rest of my life, I'm going to have to heal from what you did. Your Honor, I understand the plea guidelines are for a minimum sentence range to 25 to 40 years, and I ask you to give Larry Nassar a 40-year minimum to a 125-year maximum sentence for what he did to me. I also ask on behalf of what he did to over 100 other girls. We are all suffering, having flashbacks, unable to have normal relationships, crying at night, feeling broken, and our lives have been forever changed. He is a predator and he can't be stopped unless he is behind bars for the rest of his life. Thank you. Are you asking for restitution? Um, undecided right now. Okay, I will, I'm going to leave restitution open. Um, I'm going to decide how long, it may be six months, it may be a year, I'm not sure. And then during that time you can ask for it, mm -hmm. and then as bills come forward, you give them to the uh, prosecutor's office or the crime victim's office, I'm not sure how, who's going to receive them at this point, but you'll be advised. Okay. And then if there's any dispute, I'll decide how much, mm -hmm. but once it's open, it'll remain open during any necessary treatment, and it sounds like you've had some and it will continue. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, let me just say that I know what you're all asking for. This isn't my first rodeo with this kind of situation, so to speak, but the vastness of it is very different. Mm -hmm. You are very brave, especially at 17. Thank you. And you talk about being broken. Well, he's going to break while you're healing, and I believe he will remain broken, yes. more broken than he was as he committed these crimes against all of you, because only a broken person can do such a vile thing. So you need to understand that you're strong, you're going to get healthy, and that you are not broken, you are strong, you're mending. Yes, thank you. And you are the voice of so many young people. And I probably will say this 90 times, 98 times, 100 times, however many people I can't say it enough because it's so important what you all are doing to come here to show victims that you're not a victim any longer. There should be no victims. You have a voice and you are strong. So don't let this define you. Yes. Any of you. Go out and do great things in the world. You have just started a great rippling effect of greatness. So I thank you for being here. Thank and you. Let me know what those receipts are, okay? Okay, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Just for the record, I know that um, Jessica's mother wrote a victim impact statement, um, and I believe that's in the binder that we presented. It is. Um, her sister will also be speaking tomorrow, and I know her mother um, also presented a statement on that, so I'll remind you of that. Okay. okay. The next victim, Judge, um, is a minor, and she wishes to remain anonymous. Um, so I would ask that the media turn the cameras off at the request of that victim. So as to face in this part of support, Ms. Markham has indicated she will um, be signed at the yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And you, you are the mother? I'm the mother of Chelsea Markham. No, um, she couldn't be with us today, but I'm going to be telling you uh, from a victim's mother's point of view um, what our life has been like since um, her abuse from Larry Nassar. But I first want to tell you that my daughter was adopted from South Korea, and I got a call from our social worker that wanted to know if we would be willing to take a baby that had some medical issues in, 19, in August of 1985, and we said yes. And um, at that time, she, we picked her up at the airport, and she had a fractured skull, and she both of her ears were damaged. Um, she was delivered in a hospital using forceps, and she required several surgeries. But for a whole year, I sat up with this baby at night because she couldn't lay down. And the bond that came from her and I was just inseparable. We did everything together as she continued to grow up. And 
she um, wouldn't leave my side, and I needed to get her to be social with other kids, so I enrolled her in Montessori. And for a whole week, she screamed like a pig being cut because she thought I was leaving her. And, I, and finally, on the fifth day, she said, Mommy, I know you'll be back. And I said, yes, I will. I'm sorry. And during her normal childhood, she, you know, wanted to do all the activities that all her little friends did. And we had the Saturday morning classes and the gymboree and the, and the whatever, swim lessons. And so she really caught on to gymnastics and she was enrolled at Artistic Gymnastic Academy in Roseville, Michigan. And her um, Saturday morning hour classes turned into um, several times a week, and then um, they, the coaches asked her if she would like to join team. And um, I said, well, it's going to be her decision, but she needed to understand the um, requirements and that she needed to understand the commitment of what it meant and the dedication. And she said, yes, this is what she wanted to do. Well, um, that became five days a week, sometimes six, um, and she was made on, she went to team really quick um, because she was really good. Um, however, during, she took a fall off uh, of the beam and she um, injured her lower back. And um, I asked our coach, I said, who should we go see? And at this time she was 10 years old. And so, um, and this was in 1995. And so they said, you know, they referred us to Larry Nassar. And I said, okay, well, at the time we really didn't know, you know, much about him other than his medical reputation. So we went to see him and we traveled all the way from the east side of Michigan to Lansing, you know, several times a month for, for treatment. The last time that we went to treatment, she was at that time um, 12 years old. And um, we had this thing, her and I, that we would, after her doctor visit, we would go to this little cafe in East Lansing and have lunch and, and enjoy each other for a while before we had that long drive back home. And um, so we got in the car and I had been in the room with her during her examination, as usual. And I said, are you ready to go to lunch? And she's like, no, mom, I just want to go home. And I said, what's wrong? Are you in pain? And she said, mom, I just want to go home. I said, okay. So we got in the car and I said, and she started bawling. And I said, Chelsea, tell me what's wrong. And she said, Mom, he put his fingers in me and they weren't gloved. And I said, Chelsea, I was right there in the room. And she goes, you couldn't see what was going on, Mom. And she said, he hurt me. And I said, Chelsea, we're going back right now. And I, I mean, I was literally going to drive across the median on 96. And she said, Mom, please don't do that. I said, why? And she said, because you don't understand. Everybody will know, and everybody will judge me, and the judges will know when I compete. And I said, Chelsea, I can't do that. I have to go back. Mom, please, we'll just find another doctor. And she begged me, and she's hysterical. And I said, okay, you know, I said, I'll talk to your dad about it, but I, I may end up going back to us. So she went back to the gym the next day, and I told her coach, um, his name was Tim, and I told Tim about it. And he said, oh, no, that couldn't have happened. I've known Larry for years. And I said, well, Tim, it did happen. So um, I told him I just wanted him to know what had happened. So when I went up into the, the balcony and was sitting with the rest of the moms, um, I said, you know, did any of your girls see Larry Nassar for treatment? And a couple of them said yes. And um, they said, uh, I said, did anything, they ever say anything about unusual behavior on his part? And they said, like, no, you know, they gave me this look and I'm like, you're lying to me. But anyways, that was neither here nor there at the time because I, they weren't going to say anything. So um, we um,
that her path of destruction was bad. She was doing horrible in school. She had the self-loathing. Um, I didn't. I had her see a psychiatrist, and it didn't seem to be helping. There was a lot of self-blame. Um, she managed to get through. She had quit gymnastics the following year uh, when she was 13 because she went to a meet here in Lansing at, at Twisters, I believe it was, and he was there. And she fell off of every apparatus. She did horrible. And she says, I can't do this anymore because every time I see him, I just flash back to what happened in his office. She um, made bad decisions. Um, it affected her social life. Um, she started running with bad crowds. She got into drugs and she never really recovered. Um, her, the self, the person that was my best friend, we used to do everything together. We would watch movies. We both love movies. As a matter of fact, I hate to admit it, but on a rainy day, we went to see four movies and only paid for one. <laughs> but <laughs> um, we would bake cookies together and she loved the holidays and she would um, decorate the house and I didn't have to do anything. She just kind of like took over. So um, she did come out of it a little bit. Um, she had suffered a rape at a concert. Um, that was another thing that, that compounded her issues. Um, I think the thing that her, the worst part for her was that um, this was a man that was supposed to be the best in his field. He was supposed to help her. He was supposed to help her heal. Um, but he didn't. He abused her. He sexually abused her and he had the audacity to do that while I was sitting right there in the room. Um, I know that the other girls have similar stories. We all have the same story. But it, for my daughter, it just became a, a serious, serious um, bout of depression. And um, so in um, 2009, she took her own life because she couldn't deal with the pain anymore. It'll be 10 years in March that I lost my baby. She was 23 years old. She would have been 33 now. And every day I miss her. Every day. And it all started with him. It all started with him. It just became worse as the years went by until she couldn't deal with it anymore. And you don't know what it's like to be at work and get a call to come home immediately. And you know the mother's instinct tells you something's wrong. And you pull up in your driveway and the medical examiner is there. And your daughter's in a body bag. <laughs> and they're loading her into the van. It has destroyed our family. We used to be so close. My husband and I, I went through four years of intense therapy trying to deal with all this until I could finally accept the fact that this was not my fault. It was the fault of Larry Nassar that started all this with my daughter. And as you can see, she turned into a beautiful young lady who was really, really sick. And that's my story for her. Ma'am, I am so very sorry for the loss of your beautiful daughter. I know she's with you now and proud of your words on her behalf. I thought it was the last thing I could do for her. The very last thing. Nothing more. And you did it so very well. Suicide is never the answer. But trying to escape something like what your daughter went through was difficult. I know that you tried and she knows that you tried. But some things can't be undone. And that's 
why we're here. Someday you'll be reunited with your beautiful daughter. I'm sure she will thank you, but I'm sure she is hugging you right now. I hope so. I can see it, ma'am. <laughs> so thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Your Honor. Judge, um, the next young woman is a minor, and she does wish to be identified publicly. I'd ask that she and her parents both come up, please, before we identify them. Let me address the parents first. Please raise your right hands. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to provide with you the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the penalty of perjury? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, please state and spell your name for the record. My first name is Christine, C H R I S T I N E. Last name Capua, C A P U A. Thank you. Tim, T I M, C A P U A. Thank you. And you are the mother of this beautiful young woman? Yes. All right, thank you. And you're the father? Yes, ma'am. All right. And how old is she? 17. And you are giving your permission for her to publicly speak, to have her voice and face heard by the world? Yes, yes. All right, and no one's forced, threatened, or coerced you or promised you anything for this. Is that correct, Mom? That's correct. That's correct, Dad? Correct. All right. You may stay up here with her, or you may have a seat, whatever your preference is. That's, that's fine. And ma'am, you're ready at this point? I am. Okay, I need a nice loud voice. I think you have one of those timid voices. I need you to be heard, that's why you're here. And go at a pace that is uh, not too fast, because I see you have a statement there to read. So watch your pace. All right, please state and spell your name for the record, and then you may proceed. I'm Jade Capua, J-A-D-E-C-A-P-U-A. -E Thank you, you may proceed. Your Honor. Life through a child's eyes is a place where bad things don't make sense. Rarely do you see or hear of a child that doesn't smile at the thought of life. A child is just what I was, a 13-year-old who didn't see the world as a terrifying place. Not until I was faced with a life-changing experience that stole my innocence far too young. Not until the day that you, Mr. Nassar, violated the right to be called a doctor and took something from I and all of the other strong women that stand behind me today. I was in a state of great desperation when I paid my visit to Dr. Nassar, or as he liked his patients to refer to him, Larry. Prior to my visit, I had been recommended by gymnastics coaches. I heard words such as, you'll love him. He's a miracle worker. He can fix anyone or anything. Thinking back to these words filling my, na my naive mind, all I can think of is how this man, someone who held oh so many high credentials, was the monster who left me with more pain and scars than I came to his office with. The pain of never trusting someone physically again, and the scars of being touched and exposed in places that were completely inappropriate. That day in the office is a day that will never be forgotten. My family and I drove from Naperville, Illinois to Mr. Nassar's office at the Michigan State Facility in Lansing, Michigan. I can't begin to explain the feeling I had moments after this immoral act had been performed. I got a moment to myself after the assault when I sat in the bathroom at the facility. I sat there in great disbelief, complete shock, and total humiliation. I couldn't fathom the idea of what had just occurred. There isn't a day that goes by since July 1st, 2013 that I don't cringe at the disturbing violation that this man had put me through. This horrific headline had finally reached the media three years later of too many girls losing something that should have never been stolen. Innocence, privacy, safety, and trust. One day, about three weeks after this had initially hit the news, I was sitting in English class, and we were discussing the meaning of the word depravity. This word means wickedness or performing morally corrupt acts. 
The example my English teacher gave to further explain this disturbing word was this. One day, about three, excuse me, the other day, I saw in the news that an Olympic gymnastics doctor had, that was the moment I was dreading. That moment where I had become the victim of a heartbreaking news story that my English teacher was casually discussing in class. Of course she was unaware, everyone was. My face was filled with terror and panic as soon as the words Olympic gymnastics doctor filled the room. I sat in my desk shaking as if I was back in that office being violated. I previously described how this event stole my innocence and that is what carries with me to this day. For years, I was afraid to give myself and my trust to anyone. I wasn't willing to be hurt again. I had tried to hold on to every bit of innocence I felt I had left. I was terrified to date anyone because I knew that physically and mentally, I couldn't get past this internal barrier. I was afraid to lose myself to another person who didn't deserve it. Last year, I found someone who took me in and handled me with great care. I learned to trust his loving arms and appreciate the endless love he had for me despite my intimacy issues. I finally feel as though I got my innocence back. I gained back what I lost unexpectedly and I'm grateful for that every day. I'm speaking on behalf of all the girls who experienced this tragedy, whether it was one time or multiple times. Once is far too much to be put through. Some may be scared to share their experience. I was, I still am sometimes. There are some days that this horrifying experience fills my brain and I can't think about anything else. It left a mental scar that unfortunately will always be something that happened. However, I'm a strong believer that wounds heal into scars and these scars become stories that you share and heal from each day as time goes on. A voice must be heard in order for all these victims of this tragic event to reach a level of closure. Justice must be served. I'm speaking to all the parents out there, including my own, who could have been in the very room that this event happened, but was manipulated into believing that Mr. Nassar was healing us, as any normal doctor is supposed to do. You are not to blame. I can tell you that the thought of, well, if my parents would have just done has never crossed my brain, and I can speak on behalf of other daughters that experienced this as well. To all the significant others of these girls, nothing means more to them than the way you love them and show them how to love themselves. That is only going to help us heal, so thank you to both parents and significant others for going through these horrifying events with us and being there as a shoulder to cry on or a hand to squeeze tight. To all of the girls that have shown so much bravery throughout this, I could not be more proud of each and every one of you. Although I may not know each of you personally, I can stand here and say that you are all my heroes. Lastly, a few words to Mr. Larry Nassar. You broke and shattered a lot of girls. You manipulated us to trust you because you're a doctor and doctors do no wrong, only heal. You are not a healer. You performed acts of depravity just as my English teacher described. You are also the one that must face what you have done for the rest of your life. I am no longer broken by you. Every day I grow a new strength and look into the mirror to see a strong, unbreakable person. Nothing will ever take away what you have done to me or to the others that stand behind me. However, we can walk free and radiate the strength that we have gained from your horrific acts, something you will never be able to do. Although I no longer see the world through a child's eyes, I have become this powerful individual that is taking this opportunity to speak for what I believe in. I am not the only one who suffered from these acts, and I know that this is not an easy thing to hear. The fact of the matter is, that it doesn't matter if this topic is uncomfortable to listen to or discuss. It is something that happened and needs to be addressed. 
I am hopeful that this letter not only speaks to those in this room or those involved with this case, but to anyone who hears of these headlines. These acts were completely immoral and horrific, and I am confident that Mr. Nassar will get what he deserves. In the meantime, I hope that the effects that this trage tragedy has had on young girls is strong enough to make a change. Initially, when I was asked if I wanted to re remain anonymous when I read my letter today, I immediately thought yes. This is something about me that I have always been afraid to share with people. I couldn't help but fear that people were going to look at me differently when this was nothing, this was something that I did not ask to happen to me. After thinking about it and taking time to cope with facing this fear of mine, I decided to finally put a name to it. I am Jade Capua and I am a survivor. Thank you. Yes, you are, ma'am. And I'm really proud of your bravery and standing up for not just all of the other victims, but for people who have yet to come forward, not just in this case, but in all cases. Sadly, as you've recognized and the other victims have recognized, you're not alone in this. It happens all the time. And unfortunately, here it was with a trusted doctor who shouldn't have been trusted. I can also see, as you read your statement, I know you don't have eyes in the back of your head, but I watch the faces of your parents. They're all so emotionally distraught, but so very proud of you. I can see it. And that's so important to have them as your backup, your main people, and they're there. <laughs> your scar turned into a powerful voice. You're using it. You're a role model. You're a hero for all children without voices and your fellow victims. So I applaud you being here today, making the decision to go public. It makes a difference. It's that rippling effect that will go on, not just in America, but I think around the nation, um, in every country. So thank you for your bravery. Thank you. Alexis Moore, and she is an adult, and she has um, decided to uh, be publicly identified as well. Thank you. Please state and spell your name for the record. Alexis Moore, A-L-E-X-I-S Moore, M-O-O-R-E. Thank you. You may proceed. December 16th, 2016. I woke up from a nightmare, sweating yet chilled to the core. I knew. After months of defending the mastermind, I knew I was one of them. That afternoon, thousands of graphic images were found on multiple computers and media devices. I still think about that intuition daily. For years, Mr. Nassar convinced me that he was the only person who could help me recover from multiple serious injuries. To me, he was like a knight in shining armor. But alas, that shine blinded me from the abuse. He betrayed my trust took advantage of my youth and sexually abused me hundreds of times. For this, I believe that Mr. Nassar deserves a maximum sentence for which his actions deserve. As a nation, we need to take control. Sexual offenders need to know that they cannot continue with the crimes they are committing and that no matter how long it takes for a survivor to come forward, their crimes will be exposed and their actions will be admonished. Sexual assault and harassment should not be a part of our culture. Master Nassar should never be allowed to look at, talk to, or touch another young person again. I was the innocent nine-year-old with a broken pelvis that was willing to trust and allow the doctor to do anything to help it feel better. I had no reason not to. He treated a few of my cousins. He was friends with my mom and aunts. He had pictures of Olympians and thank you notes from floor to ceiling in the MSU sports medicine office. I gazed at them during every appointment. I knew the story behind many of the portraits. He shared them with me. 
I was the 18 year old preparing to go away to college, apprehensive and just hoping my body would be able to withstand four more years of the sport that defined my life. 10 years of abuse and neglect. I don't like the word victim. Being a victim implies a desire for pity. I am a survivor, but more so I am me. And those 10 years are a part of my story. They have helped to define who I am today. Today I am more guarded than I was a year ago, but I am also wiser and more aware. Today it is my job to be an even better role model and mentor and to be an advocate in saying that this does not define the sport of gymnastics or the medical profession. I have the honor of working with young girls every day. They listen to what I say, get notifications every time I post to Instagram, analyze what I do, pick up, my, pick up on my vocabulary and copy how I dress. It is my job to teach them to be humble and kind, strong-willed and determined, gritty and confident. It is my job to teach these girls that they can be the most powerful, amazing, and influential, influential humans if they so choose, and to help them realize that they have a voice and they have the ability to stand up for what they believe in. It is my job to ensure that every nine-year-old I work with knows that she has an amazing future ahead of her and to ensure that every 18-year-old I know realizes that she has the power to define who she is that no matter what she goes through, she will always have people in her corner and she should have faith to help her get through it. It is not my job to point out the flaws in the system and what others could have done to protect my innocence. That truth will one day be exposed. But it is my job to make a difference and an impact on the world and to help stop monster-like humans from abusing their power. I am working on forgiving you, Mr. Nassar. One day I will be able to, but I will never forget what you have done. I must ask you this. Are you remorseful for your actions and all of the lives that you have changed forever? Do you regret misusing your medical dominance? I could hear it in your voice that November day when you pled guilty. You are sorry for the pain that you have caused. You had the same sincerity as you told me the story of why you blame yourself for sweet Caroline's birth story, as you hugged me at your brother Mike's funeral. In all of those times, you told me I just needed to rest and could not compete. Saying that you did nothing for me would be a lie. You helped to heal me, my fragile bones that is. You shared your knowledge and gave me some invaluable advice but you also abused your power and my trust in you, and that is not okay. My love for humanity is greater than the fear of the unknown. My voice is louder than my inner thoughts. My hope for change is more prevailing than my desire to ask, why me? Why was I the nine-year-old? This past year, I have had countless somber days and incredibly long, sleepless nights. I've clenched my jaw as I heard strangers wonder how he really did what he did and turned the other way as I saw his face on the front page of the newspaper in the gas station. I have held back tears when friends asked how he was holding up. I've looked into my parents' hardened eyes seeing their pain from now knowing that their only child was molested right in front of them in the same room. When no one is around, I have cried and sobbed, felt a rush of every emotion and solidified my belief that I have the most amazing family and an incredible circle of friends. And I have had to think through and talk about the hundreds, hundreds of appointments and NASA home visits and cringe at all of the times I should have said something about the improper treatments and oath-breaking moments. But I didn't and I cannot look back anymore. I am determined to be more involved in making this world a better place. I can use my voice, my education, 
in my experiences to help stop females and males alike from not standing up for themselves and others. After all, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here, for your words, for allowing the world to hear them. You certainly are that pillar of strength, that role model, that mentor. Such insight for such a young person, that's a gift. You've okay. chosen to accept that gift and not let it destroy you, and I'm so proud of you and honored to know you. Thank you. And I hope that everyone you come in contact with recognizes what a privilege it is to know you. Thanks. Thank you for being here. At this time, we are going to take a 15-minute break.